Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you. Hello and welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney, president of LPB. Joining me to moderate tonight's episode is Barry Irwin, CEO of the Council for a Better Louisiana. Thanks, Beth. As always, it's great to be here. If you were to look into the origins of the word litter, you'd discover it's derived from the Latin word for bed. This eventually gave rise to other definitions of litter, like the straw and hay thrown down as bedding for pets. It wasn't a great, great leap for litter to ultimately encompass the layers of trash that cover our roads and choke our waterways. Well, this is truly a bed that we have made and now have to lie in. Over 80% of litter is intentional. Cigarette butts, plastic bottles, and bags tossed by pedestrians and drivers. It's also costly. It is estimated that Louisiana taxpayers spend $40 million annually on litter removal and enforcement. Tonight, we will examine the extent of the problem and the role of government and residents in combating it. We start with a story from the capital city to see how trash makes its way into our watersheds. Hidden among the 440 acres of green space at LSU's Burden Gardens is an 81-ton eyesore. The largest hot spot is about an acre of accumulation of aquatic trash. Uh, those areas are mostly styrofoam and plastic bottles. Other areas, such as this behind me, is a mixture of about everything that floats. Jeffrey Keeney oversees the botanical gardens. He says the litter has collected over 50 years and is nearly 20 feet deep. When I came out here 10 years ago um, as director, I really walked the property and started researching, you know, what is this property about? And when I walked out here and saw all this litter, I thought, oh my God, is did we dump this back here? And, and after I investigated a little further, I realized that this didn't come from LSU or my staff. This came from the people of Baton Rouge. This 30 acre wetlands is connected to Ward Creek. And Ward Creek is the major artery that drains most of the stormwater out of East Baton Rouge Parish. Rain events carry tossed litter into storm drains. The water then travels into the wetlands, leaving trash behind as it recedes. It's not only an aesthetics issue, but an economic one. The litter can trigger flooding like the city saw in 2016. And so our wetlands, instead of being able to hold water, eventually collect soil and layers of aquatic trash. And so they're not able to take in all of that storm water that they naturally were able to many, many years ago. Keeney says Baton Rouge's stormwater management program, which all cities must file with the feds, hasn't adequately addressed the problem. We have not been taking care of it properly for many years. This is evidence of it. EPA knows about it. Now DEQ is involved in it too. And so the city has to do something about it, not just for our local population, but it's being mandated. He points to Lafayette as a success story for its handling of Bayou Vermilion. They actually have a millage that's collected to keep that trash out of their bayou. And so that's a very good example of what we need to do across the state. Just educating the public that we can't throw out our cans and our plastic bottles is not gonna solve the problem. We're gonna to have to have equipment placed in our wetlands, our canals and our channels in order to remove that litter out of our wetlands and prevent it from creating issues like we have here. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, joining us in the studio to give an overview of Louisiana's litter problem is our first panel. Susan Russell is the executive director of Keep Louisiana Beautiful. 
Stephanie Regal is the editor of the Baton Rouge Business Report and recently wrote a cover story on the capital city's litter issues. And Dr. Mark Benfield is with LSU's Department of Oceanography and Coastal Sciences. He started globally tracking a new class of COVID-related litter. Thanks everybody for joining us and really glad to have you here with us. Susan, I'd like to start with you. Um, how does Louisiana's litter prevention and abatement strategy stack up to other states? And what more would you like to see us do here in Louisiana? Well, Barry, the truth is we really do not have a comprehensive statewide strategy. <laughs> and that is really why we're in the problem, you know, that we face now. And so when you think of how expansive this problem is, uh, it, it doesn't discriminate. It's in every parish in our state. It affects all 4.7 million citizens. It's in rural areas, it's problems in large cities, uh, black, white, young, old. It makes no difference. It affects us all. And so when you think of something that is that detrimental to our state, when it affects our business community and growth and tourism and wildlife, and marine life, and I can go on and on. Um, I don't know that, that there's another problem that is really not being addressed the way it should be. Uh, we really need our stakeholders all together to come up with a statewide comprehensive litter abatement plan. And we need input from our educators, from enforcement, from our business community, our local government, our state government, cross section of all of our communities to sit down and do the hard work that's needed to create a statewide comprehensive plan and figure out how to fund it. We hear about litter hotspots. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what we're talking about with litter hotspots? Hotspots in every community you're going to find um, on roadways, U-turns, um, you're going to find them wherever uh, wind and rain will, will blow uh, uh, litter. Uh, at the end of dead end streets where people aren't watching, you know, New Orleans Eats has a huge problem with dumping. Um, because it's an area that nobody watches and litter begets litter and so does dumping. And so it starts there and if it's not removed quickly, almost overnight it seems, it becomes a huge hot spot. Right now we know that the state spends over $40 million on litter abatement. DOTD spends over $8 million alone picking up litter on the roadway and our state is still littered. So think about what it would look like if we focused that amount of money on preventative measures instead of picking up litter. Yeah, really a huge problem that I guess we don't think about a lot. Stephanie, you uh, just recently wrote a, a big cover story in Baton Rouge Business Report, uh, actually highlighting one of the things we just saw in the video out at Burden, which is a beautiful place, but I've never seen anything that, that looked like that on those properties. Tell me a little bit about what you learned uh, from your reporting, uh, particularly here in Baton Rouge, uh, the, the scope of the problem. What we covered in the story and, and what I really found out was that there are so many prongs, there's so many rabbit holes you can go down with this. And, you know, as Susan mentioned, we don't have a comprehensive litter abatement strategy. We don't have a culture in Louisiana, and certainly not here in Baton Rouge, where litter has been a, a priority or, you know, even something in the forefront of the public mind. Um, we don't have enforcement, certainly in Baton Rouge, and city leaders have said, well, it's very difficult to catch dumpers or litterers in the act. And this is true, but that can't be an excuse. You know, other places, they do it. People here don't recycle in great enough numbers and they don't bag their trash properly. And that also creates or can add to the problem. It's not the sole reason, but it adds to the problem. And then beyond that, um, the litter that does get into the watershed, we don't have the adequate equipment to catch it. There are something like 250 canal outfalls that, that dump into the watershed in Baton Rouge. We only have boons or, or litter catching equipment at three of them, wow. and they're all pretty near LSU. And you saw an, a picture of it on the video there, and it's just like a big sieve. It catches the litter, and then you have to clean it out periodically. That doesn't address the problem at the root, but it at least keeps it from getting further downstream. And that's something in Baton Rouge that we don't have. And, and beyond that, we don't have a funding source to buy that kind of equipment, even if there was the collective will to go ahead and purchase and install it and maintain it. So, I mean, it's, it's a messaging issue. 
it's um, it's teaching people how to change their behavior, and it's also a funding and resource issue. Somebody from state government or city government really needs to take the lead and say, we need to have a plan, we need to buy this equipment, we need to fund the purchase of this equipment and the maintenance. And it's not terribly expensive. You know, we're not talking about solving some insurmountable problem. Other places have showed us how to do it. Um, it, it's not cheap, it's not free, but it, it's doable and it's manageable. And that was one thing that we found in the, in the reporting, but, um, but it has to be done and it hasn't been so far. It's not the Brum administration's fault. This is a problem that goes way back. Like, like Jeff said in the video, it's like 50 years sure. worth of trash in that low-lying wetlands area at Burden. Wow, we've just let this accumulate and, and just do not seem to have had the will uh, to date to really address it. Dr. Benfield, I want to turn to you real quickly because you have uh, begun doing some research in an area of litter that's related to the pandemic and COVID. Uh, so I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that and what you've learned from that. Sure, so prior to the pandemic, if you walked down the street in anywhere in Louisiana, you would find water bottles and plastic bags and styrofoam clamshells and cups and things like that. Since the pandemic, that's changed. We've added a completely new class of what we call personal protective equipment or PPE uh, waste. And so we're talking about things like face masks, uh, rubber gloves, uh, uh, sanitizing wipes, uh, hand sanitizer bottles, the packaging for all those products. And then as the pandemic has progressed, we're starting to see things like nasal swabs. I found parts of a, a COVID-19 test kit so, you know, there's a myriad of, of completely new, non-degradable plastic products that are being put out there. And we're finding a lot of trends that, you know, we are intuitive in terms of what we know about other sorts of litter. For example, the availability of the product seems to be related to its abundance on the streets. At the beginning of the pandemic, we didn't have masks uh, available widely in the United States. And so we didn't see masks on the street and then wipes just continue to increase. Uh, you know, data, recent interview with the CEO of Clorox said that in uh, uh, the last quarter of 2019, they produced one million canisters of Clorox wipes. Wow. This year, uh, just last week, she said they're now up to 1.5 million canisters a day. Oh. Man, that's a big change. Well, since you have studied this problem globally, um, what do you see in other countries in terms of trying to address it? Do we see any um, positive examples or models out there? Yeah, we do. I think all of the countries that we've looked at are in the same boat. They're all struggling to deal with this amount of litter uh, and, and they're not really succeeding. One interesting outlier, and this goes back to what Susan said, is that litter uh, begets more litter. Um, if you don't have trash cans, if you don't have a ready place to dispose of this stuff, then it's going to accumulate. And when people see it on the ground, they're going to think, well, you know, someone else did it, so I can put it out there too. The city of Shenzhen, which is a mega city in southern China, um, one of our data sites is from a, a suburb called University Town there. It's about six campuses altogether. So I asked my colleague to do a survey there, and she came back and said she didn't find any PPE waste. And I asked her why, and she said, well, outside every building on the campus and regularly uh, located throughout the, the uh, grounds are dedicated PPE disposal bins. And so people use them. That's not to say there isn't other trash there, but they certainly are using these disposal bins. And so I think that's a model for us, that it, every mega mall, every box store, every strip mall should have these uh, disposal sites located right outside so that customers leaving the store have a ready place to dispose of this stuff. Yeah, Susan, let me turn back to you. Um, I understand that Keep Louisiana Beautiful offers classroom resources, uh, educational resources, and I'm just wondering if you could tell our viewers how teachers might be able to access and, and what are the opportunities uh, in the classroom? Sure, we were just in Baton Rouge this Saturday and we did an in-person teacher workshop and so we train the trainer in a sense to where we bring the teachers in and we do workshop on our program so that they can bring it into the classroom but we have 10 lesson plans for k through five and it aligns with the student standards we also have um, 20 activity sheets uh, they're 
full of resources and, and, and act hands-on activities for the kids. And they're all free and can be downloaded on our website, which is keeplouisianabeautiful.org. And we encourage the teachers to bring this into the classroom and teach it because education is such a critical part of this. We need to break that cycle. We need to get it to them at a young age and teach them how to be good community citizens and how to be um, uh, environmental stewards and the kids love this they uh, they really embrace it sometimes it's the, it's the adults that we have the hardest <laughs> you know time with but um, you know there's not one solution to this as we have all mentioned education is a piece enforcement is a piece there's also the the role of the business community like to Mark's point transition points are besides roadside that is the place where most people will litter. So can we can we pass ordinances that require businesses to have trash and ash receptacles at the transition points when people enter the stores and are more likely to litter? Um, there's roles for parishes and municipalities. We have a grants program. We've awarded over three million dollars of grants through the years to nonprofits and municipalities and parishes to help them build capacity to fight these issues that we're talking about. And one of our grants provides trash receptacles because we know that they're expensive. And we also know that when a trash receptacle is there, to Mark's point, there's a reduction of 52% of litter. So they work. And we've had some municipalities that won't even apply for the grant because they can't afford the labor to service them. So that's when we talk about like the infrastructure and the funding. It's not just about picking up the litter off the ground and we solve the problem. This is very deep and it needs to be approached on multi levels and we need everyone at the table. And I know everybody doesn't want to hear this, but it's true. It takes money. But to my point, should we be spending money on the back end? or would it be smarter for us to spend it on the front end? Good question, and actually I wanted to turn to Stephanie because one of the things that uh, you discussed in your reporting was uh, about our stormwater management program. And uh, actually all the cities need to have those types of things, but there are actually consequences, big financial consequences, if we find ourselves out of compliance with some of these issues. Could you talk a little bit about that issue, at least how it relates here in Baton Rouge? Well, sure, because you know, as you mentioned, we're required to have this plan on file with the EPA. It's administered through the state DEQ. And going back at least 10 years, Baton Rouge has been out of compliance on its stormwater management plan. And so where we are now, and, and I mean, the two sides have gone back and forth, they haven't found specific toxins in our water quality, but there are just all sorts of gaping holes and lack of information in our plan about how we plan to deal with the waste and the litter as it gets into the watershed. And EPA and DEQ, they keep coming back to the city. You can follow the written correspondence and say, what about this, this, and this? Months and years go by, we still don't address it. So where we are now is that EPA is down here. There are some sort of legal negotiations going on. We could be staring at a federal consent decree, which would mean if it's in implemented that they would force solutions on us, which would be probably a lot more costly in the long run than if we had addressed these problems on the front end. Now, I mean, they may be able to work out some sort of a, some sort of a solution, but it's just, you know, to Susan's point, it speaks to the problem that it's gotten this far, that now the feds and the state are involved in telling us how to solve a problem that we should have solved ourselves on the front end many years ago. Well, certainly a lot of food for thought there. And right now I want to thank our panel, uh, Susan Russell, uh, Stephanie Regal, and Dr. Benfield for helping us get a better handle on the litter problems that we face here in Louisiana. Tackling trash in Louisiana is a three-pronged approach involving state agencies, individual municipalities, and residents. We'll explore the role of local and state governments next after a brief overview. When it comes to controlling litter in Louisiana, state police and the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries are the key players in enforcement. Fines can climb to $175 for simple littering, like trash flying from a truck bed, $250 for intentional littering from a vehicle, and up to $1,000 for gross littering, large amounts of trash tossed into ditches. 
illegal dumping falls under the Department of Environmental Quality and carries higher penalties. I have the ability right now to charge $32,500 per day. Uh, and I am getting to that point to where if, if you are a willful violator, a repeat offender, then you could be subject to those types of fines. DEQ Secretary Chuck Brown explains the challenge the agency faces from used tire dealers. Well, what they do is they bring in 2,000 tires in a truck. They'll call through and see 500 they can resell. And if I don't, if I'm not careful, those 1,500 will end up in somebody's field, on the side of the road, or in New Orleans East. Preventing stormwater pollution from making it into the state's watersheds is the responsibility of each municipality. DEQ oversees these stormwater management programs for the EPA. Every city has so many miles, hundreds of miles of, of right of way that they maintain, and they have to have a plan in place to be able to basically manage or forbid litter from getting into the lakes uh, or the rivers or the receiving streams. East Baton Rouge Parish is currently in talks with the agency after failing its stormwater audit for a fourth time. The next step could be a mandated consent decree. Joining us now to explore how cities and the state monitor litter is our next panel. Monique Boulay is CEO of the Acadiana Planning Commission. Her organization oversees the watershed management of 16 parishes. Sergeant Garrett Kimball has been working in the enforcement division of the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries since 2005. Nikita Simon is an environmental compliance specialist with the Department of Transportation and Development, or DOTD. Her duties include wastewater and stormwater inspections. And joining us remotely is Constable Rick Moore, a litter enforcement officer for St. Tammany Parish. He organized their litter court, which has served as a model statewide. Um, Monique, I wanted to start with you. Um, tell us a little bit about what your organization does and why it is so important in terms of litter and litter control. Sure. So the Acadiana Planning Commission is the administrator for the Louisiana Watershed Region 5. Um, and the Louisiana Watershed Initiative, I'm sorry, um, is, a, is a statewide effort to really change our mentality and help our municipalities and our parishes and and, and all of the associated organizations to really start thinking from a watershed initiative. One of the things immediately after the flood of 2016 um, that really brings home the issue of litter in watershed management was one of the projects that we're still working on today to fix. In Abbeville, um, the old, uh, the new bypass, Highway 14, went underwater and there are two bridges over the Vermilion River. The old bridge was the only way in and out and what was happening was litter debris was building up on one side of the bridge. So you actually had water flow stop. <clears throat> and as the houses and, and structures were going underwater, the town was begging DOTD to lift the bridge. Well, DOTD could not lift the bridge because if there was an issue getting it back down, you couldn't get emergency crews and response people in. And so you don't realize when you drop a can at the mall and it ends up in the drain that it's going to potentially really create flooding. You know, we didn't, we didn't expect that. And the Vermilion River is well managed and trash is picked up every day. So, you know, even with that um, effort going on, we still have significant issues from, liver, from, from litter. Absolutely. Sergeant Kimball, let me turn to you on that. We had seen earlier in the program uh, some of the examples of litter when it gets into, uh, you know, some of our wetland areas and areas like that. With wildlife and fisheries, I, I would imagine you see a lot of that. And if you could tell us a little bit about that problem from, from your perspective at wildlife and fisheries. Sure. Yeah, litter has such a negative impact on the, on the wildlife and fish uh, habitat in Louisiana. And, you know, We've had issues where used fishing line has been tangled up around uh, animals and fish, and, and that causes issues, obviously, in the, with their health. Um, there have been animals found with, um, dead animals found with, with plastics and cigarette butts and stuff like that stuck in their stomachs. And so um, it, it's an obvious uh, health issue for the game and the fish, as well as, uh, you know, making their habitat um, dirty and, and, and have bacteria and those those animals and those fish they they need clean habitat. 
Nikita, let me go to you right now from DOTD's perspective. Um, what is DOTD's role in terms of stormwater management and how does that impact the litter situation in Louisiana? Sure. So DOTD is considered an MS4 and that stands for Municipal Separate Stormwater Sewer System. And we are, we have, we operate under an MS4 permit issued by the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality. Under this permit, we are required to implement a statewide stormwater management program. And um, also under the permit, we are also required to incorporate six minimum control measures into the permit to address our um, discharges from our drainage systems, our construction sites, and our facilities. And so to incorporate best management practices for each of those. And that basically means we have standard goals and practices to achieve those goals. One minimum control measure is public outreach and education. So in our efforts to educate the public, we have brochures at our rest areas and our um, welcome centers that address stormwater pollution. One is called After the Storm, another is called Understanding Stormwater. Both of these brochures give a general overview of what storm pol stormwater pollution is, its sources, the problems it creates, and how to prevent the polluted runoff. In addition to these um, brochures, we also have children activity packets that, um, that help children understand how they can be a solution to water pollution and to help their uh, family and friends um, recognize what litter is and how it contributes to water pollution and um, how to be not the problem but part of the solution. Well, that's great. I wanted to turn now to Constable Moore because I was fascinated to learn that you helped establish a litter court for St. Tammany Parish way back in 2001. I was wondering if you could explain a little bit about how a litter court works and kind of the role you play uh, in the litter court. Uh, yes, sir, Barry. Well, thank you for uh, allowing me to be on your program today. Uh, my name is Rick Moore. Um, I am a constable in St. Tammany Parish for the last 20 years. Very few people know the, <clears throat> know the jurisdiction of a JP and a constable. Uh, but a few of us got together about 20 years ago and went to the state of Louisiana, and particularly the attorney general's office, and sat down with them to develop some type of structure to establish litter court. Uh, it was passed by the legislature uh, back in 2001. And after that point, we, we went into our local government, uh, St. Tammany Parish government, and worked with them to develop ordinances in order to, con to control litter in our parish. And what we basically did was just mirror the state law at that time and, and moved it into our parish ordinance. Uh, the state statute that you can refer to to uh, review this is RS 13-2586. And it's a state law, anybody can use it, uh, city, cities, municipalities, and as well as uh, parishes. Now look, this was slow going. This wasn't a fast process by any means. Um, it was it was tedious. Uh, no one was there to teach us how to do this court. We learned as we went along and as we grew and we developed this into a, a model of a letter court as it is today. Um, it, we were proud uh, to be able to prosecute the offenders because at that time, litter was everywhere in St. Tammany Parish. And we just wanted a tool to, to control letter and to remove illegal signs off of telephone poles and in the ditches and so forth. Uh, we treated our court fairly and had due process all through the process. And, and I wanna also let you know that uh, letter court is, is uh, established with one just of the peace and two constables. So basically uh, an entire parish can have a letter court with one, one judge. And the, and the two constables, one on max as a uh, a witness to the event, the offender, and the second constable acts as a prosecutor. And that's stated in state law that that could be set up that way. We heard earlier in the program about a success story with uh, the manage management of uh, Bayou Vermilion. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about that, how that is funded and, and kind of how that operates? Sure, we have a, a millage. Um, it's uh, actually the one of the only regional uh, funded millages where four parishes put in and it, it, it's, a, it's a local millage. Now I will say with the watershed initiative, we're looking statewide at really funding a different way to manage our, our waterways. And over the next 12 to 18 months, and we've already started the outreach process, we will be meeting with all of our local uh, governments and, and the key stakeholders in each of the areas to really ask that question. You know, we have serious problems with drainage 
and that and litter is included in that. And so, how how do we address that? We we have to look at probably um, um, uh, several different funding mechanisms. I don't think there's a, a one answer for, for the, the enormity of the problem that we have with our watershed management. And, and again, litter is part of that. So right now, the Bayou Vermilion District and the Tesh Freshwater District is funded by a local millage. Um, that is one of the funding mechanisms that we're going to be looking at. Do you see that kind of as a model maybe for other areas to, to follow suit uh, on that type of approach? I think it can be. Those millages are very specific right now, and so they're limited to, to the function of that millage, and, and that's what happens with millages. And really, we have to look at our watersheds all the way from the litter that goes into them to how we build in and around them. And so it's a big question. There's a, there's a, I know, I know the state um, has put together a white paper on all of the different funding mechanisms. And, and again, I don't think anybody feels like there's a, there's a one solution answer to this. I think it's gonna, it's gonna have to be multiple funding mechanisms and really a mindset shift. We really have to think differently about our waterways. I think many generations, at least several generations ago, our waterways were a real asset and we built on high ground and we, we thought about them differently and we treated them differently and somehow along the way they've just become part of our landscape and and not really as as important in our culture I think as they were at one time. So changing our mind shift and understanding the impacts on our waterways, on the water quality, um, the, the the content in the water, all that we have to really think different about that and so so Funding it, I don't think is, again, I don't think there's one answer. I think, and, and meeting with the different jurisdictions, when you say millage, everybody throws their hands up. No, it's kind of like, you know, saying cancer before you say something much more minor. Um, so maybe a millage is only a piece of it, but, you know, maybe there's, there are fees, there are uh, usage fees. Maybe, um, I mean, we're looking at, at a multiple, and we really are getting feedback. We really are going very local to the people who are making the decisions and, 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 uh, actually the people who are maintaining our waterways, the public works directors in Vilplat and, and in, you know, um, all the way down in St. Mary Parish, you know, their work is interconnected. And so we're, we're meeting with all of them and really getting that feedback um, and, and hoping to come up with some really good funding solutions that people can live with. Well, one thing we're learning very much out of this is it's a very complicated problem. Um, Sergeant Kimball, we heard a little bit earlier um, in, the, in the piece about the penalties that we have in Louisiana for littering, and we heard from uh, DEQ about the large number of uh, amounts of fines that they can uh, uh, assess uh, for littering. What do you think is, is part of the issue there? Do we have enough in terms of tools, in terms of fines, assessments, that type of thing? Is that the problem? Or is it more like maybe what um, Monique is talking about? It's a, a mindset change that we need more of right I think uh, you know in Louisiana the the penalties for littering range from $175 fine to roughly a thousand dollars in fines um, as well as the possibility of um, having to do some type of community service such as litter pickup um, Louisiana law categorizes um, littering acts in three three different types um, simple littering intentional littering and then gross littering. Simple littering would be driving down the road having something in the back of your vehicle flying out the, the back of your vehicle. Intentional littering would be um, such as driving down the road and intentionally throwing something like a drink container or a fast food wrapper or something like that out the window of your vehicle or out of the boat, uh, out of your boat into the water. Um, gross littering would be dumping large amounts of trash, um, household garbage, uh, bags of household garbage, tires, furniture, stuff like that. Um, I certainly think that, that uh, increased penalties or, or harsher penalties for the intentional and the gross littering uh, would be uh, more of a deterrent effect for, uh, in, for littering acts. Nikita, let me ask you about something. I've heard about the DOTD Adopt a Road program. Sounds like a really good idea. Sounds like maybe it's something that also could address the problem and maybe save money as well. Could, could you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. So the Adopt the Road program is a DOTD sponsor program that enlists volunteers to, um, to remove litter and debris from our federal and state roadsides. Um, it does save taxpayers money because it's completely voluntary. 
Um, the program also provides recognition to the volunteer groups and organizations that participate in the program. Um, it promotes um, civic responsibility and pride in your community. It makes the public aware of that and it helps to keep Louisiana just clean and green. Um, so if there are any groups, volunteer groups or organizations that see an area in their community that they think needs to be cleaned, um, what they would need to do is contact their local DOT district office to verify that uh, that area is available to be adopted in the Adopt the Road program and submit application. And that's basically it. it there's, there's a little more information um, on our website, which is www.dotd.la.gov. Well, I hope people will take you up on that and take a look at that. Constable Moore, I wanted to come back to you. Um, one question I had was, um, if I see somebody littering and I'm in a parish like yours that has a litter court, what does a citizen do in terms of reporting or how does that mechanism work? Well, we have numerous ways of supporting a litter in our parish. Uh, we have website. We have signs that are all over the parish. We have you, you use your phone book, the sheriff's office, uh, uh, the the, the uh, parish, got city of governments, the Facebook as well. But we have numerous ways to do it. Uh, our most popular way is that it's on a website. People can go to a, a government website. It has a, a drop down box to report letter. You can also go to Keep St. Tammany Beautiful website. They also have a uh, area where you can report letter. And what we're proud of that we came across is what's called an affidavit. It's called a litter affidavit, which engages the public into helping us uh, with fight and litter. Because without the public, without their eyes and ears out there, it becomes impossible to fight litter. But they go online to fill out the affidavit. Uh, it comes back to our office. We then we start investigating. It, it, we, it could be a license plate number. It could be a credit card. It could be a, uh, a bag on the side of the road, virtually anything. And we have the um, subpoena powers, meaning the Justice of Pieces have the subpoena powers to search and get phone numbers, for instance, to uh, locate these offenders. Because we have numerous dump sites around our parish, like I'm sure all the parishes do. But uh, they could also, we also have a mechanism in place uh, throughout the different wards, because the JP and constables are, their jurisdictions are called wards. And what the parish has done is we've put up signs within uh, their areas with their name, phone number, addresses on it. So the general public can can call those numbers, they can report litter, and that gets reported to the constables. And then we go out and investigate and try to clean up our parish. It's, it's taken a long time to get to this point, and uh, we're just proud of what we've uh, accomplished. Well, that's great. Sergeant Kimball, just to follow up on that same question, from your perspective uh, with Wildlife and Fisheries, if somebody sees a violation, should they go to you, to Wildlife and Fisheries, the police? What's the, the best angle for people to take there? Right, yeah, we, we always urge citizens to get involved. I mean, we have such a uh, beautiful scenic landscape in Louisiana, and we should all be proud of that, and we should all take action to, to try to help protect that. And so uh, we always urge citizens to call the litter hotline, which is uh, one eight 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 litterbug l-i-t-r-b-u-g um, or you can always reach out to your local wildlife agent um, if you have contact with them uh, reach out to them and 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 give them the, the specifics on you know if you saw someone littering and um, you can also reach out to your regional wildlife and fisheries office well thanks so much and that's all the time we have for in this segment thanks very much to ms boulet sergeant kimball ms simon and constable moore for their input we know that over 80% of litter is intentional, so how can people's bad behaviors be changed? We'll hear next from some folks who are helping set some good examples, but first, an LSU researcher shares some troubling data about recycling, and a Shreveport organization illustrates four proven ways to help people do the right thing. How do you stop people from littering? Studies show it's hard to change ingrained habits. Dr. Margaret Reams is a professor of environmental science at LSU. In the 90s, she studied the amount of litter in several Baton Rouge neighborhoods that didn't recycle versus one that had for many years. In that older pilot community uh, and also in the communities with no curbside recycling yet, uh, we saw, you know, higher levels of all kinds of, of littering. So uh, it was, again, just the beginning of some insight that the participation of recycling for the first time uh, maybe generated sort of a warm glow and a, a feeling of altruism 
uh, and pro-environmental you know, behavior, but there was not really evidence that it would carry over to really just a reduction in litter in general. For Donna Curtis, director of Shreveport Green, it's all about enforcement. After 25 years at the helm, she's been able to get the city to open an environmental court. We will have um, attorneys or judges that sit and listen to these code enforcement and litter violations, and then that's all they listen to, and they are going to hold them a little more accountable. Her organization does regular cleanups, relying on a bench of volunteers 13,000 deep. The group recently distributed containers around the city to collect cigarette butts and targets litter that flies from truck beds. Twice a year, we've been able to do tarp giveaways with the bungee cords and everything, that they can come pick up a tarp if they sign a pledge saying they're going to use this tarp to keep control things in the back of their trucks. Measures like these make it easier for people not to litter, one of four proven ways to change behaviors. An increase in pro-environmental values in a community can also exert positive peer pressure. We have a clean business program where we uh, work with the businesses to clean up their areas. They have a check sheet that they can go through and figure out ways that maybe they can stop litter from inside the offices to the outside to even their, their vehicles. Educational programs provided through groups like Keep Louisiana Beautiful help students understand the harmful effects of litter. The final way to change behavior is to create confidence that what a person does makes a meaningful difference, something Shreveport Green has hard data on. We discovered that after our first year of in being in business and working on this, that we had a reduction of 85% litter. Curtis says litter indicates people don't care, an attitude she hopes we all can change. The image of litter in a community is very detrimental. It hurts tourism. It ruins property values. The results of litter are all over the place. Providing ways for citizens to get involved in Louisiana's war on litter is the topic of our third panel. Marie Constantine is an award-winning photographer best known for her iconic images of Mother Teresa. She's currently on a mission to half, uh, halt the litter flow to the Capitol Lake across from the governor's mansion. Stefik Rainey is a member of Louisiana's Legislative Youth Advisory Council. He serves on the Environmental Committee and is a contender for the EPA's Presidential Youth Award. And joining us remotely from Thibodeau is Alma Robichaud. She's a member of the Louisiana Recycling Coalition and has worked in marine education and research for 25 years. So welcome to all of you. Marie, let's start with you. And I've seen the videos of this and it's just amazing to me, but you and volunteers have collected enough bags of litter from Capitol Lake right by the governor's mansion to fill a football field. Um, what inspired you to take on this project and what have you learned about how litter gets there and then how we can eliminate it? Yeah, we're, um, we're up to 710 bags now. Wow. So that football field's getting real full. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> But um, what inspired me, I went down um, beginning of last year and down to the lake to walk my dog and I saw litter is it, the density that I've never seen in my life. It, it was just shocking. It made me so sad. And the truth is I, saw, I thought of Mother Teresa's words, you know, I'm not called to be successful, I'm called to be faithful. And I said, well, this applies here because there's no way anybody can clean this up. So I thought, I'm gonna give a year of my life, I'm just gonna come down, pick up litter, not worry, and I'm gonna post on Facebook. So I started posting on Facebook, and then I think people felt sorry for me, <laughs> and so they started saying, can I come help? And before you know it, we cleaned up the whole lake, literally, except for the northern wooded part. And so then, um, to our horror, to our absolute horror, we discovered that we cleaned it and celebrated, and we discovered 41 bags a month were flowing in from the city's untreated storm, storm drains because we have wow. 250 storm canals and three booms in the entire city. And um, Capital Lakes, really the city was the litter bug. And so that's how this all got started. Well, that's amazing. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But Stefik, let me turn to you. Uh, tell us a little bit about the uh, Legislative Youth Advisory Council and particularly your role in the Environmental Committee uh, of LIAC. Right. So 
The Legislative Youth Advisory Council is a group of 31 students from around the state of Louisiana. Uh, we're chosen by the Commission on Civic Education and we meet to try to um, advocate for issues currently affecting the youth in our state and um, to meet with legislators and local leaders to present our ideas to them. Uh, every year we try to pass some actual policy and legislation and on the environmental committee, which I serve on, uh, we look at issues affecting the youth regarding uh, the natural environment. And this year, um, litter and reducing pollution is one of our main focuses. And we're really looking at different um, avenues that we can take with different uh, policies and initiatives that we can implement to try to reduce uh, litter and pollution. Well, that's great and that's very encouraging to get, you're helping to get young people involved in that. Uh, Alma Robichaud, I wanted to turn to you really quickly. Um, how well do you think Louisiana is doing as far as recycling goes and, and what are some of the challenges we face there? Well, uh, we're not doing well at all. We are currently last in the nation for recycling. In fact, we have about a 6% recycling rate in Louisiana. So it's very discouraging. And the problem is, is that we're a very rural state, which means that most municipalities do not have options for recycling. We only have one residential recycling facility in the state, and it is currently in Baton Rouge. And so if you are a municipality that is further away, it's, you have transportation costs, you have collection costs, and then disposal costs. And because there's only one facility, uh, pricing options are limited. And then on the other hand, landfills are plentiful in our state. And because of that, the tipping rates on the landfills are relatively low. So when a municipality is deciding on how to dispose of its residential waste, it's cheaper and easier to go right to the landfill instead of to the recycling plant. Marie, let me turn back to you uh, talking about, you know, follow up really on that issue right there. How does, for instance, in the area of Capital Lake, how does all that litter, all of that plastic really get into, you know, the areas like that? And what are some of the solutions? Because I know you've looked at some of those that, that would actually help us get rid of that stuff permanently. Well, first of all, I don't think that 80% of litter is intentional. I think it's um, intentional and some percentage is the way we handle waste. And I don't, I think litter is so complicated, we can't really say that but whatever it is something we're doing is not wrong is not right we we need to pivot and change our thinking and look at what other states have done and we know that other states are successful so in the terms of capital lake we're going to go from 41 bags flowing in when we get uh, uh, several booms in the northdale canal supplied by uh, braff and the state we're going to go from 41 to between two and six we're gonna have a plus 80% success rate in Capital Lakes just because of these booms. And now I know Lafayette is working with the Vermilion. It's been tremendously successful there and they've grown ecotourism because of it. But we found out even more stuff that's fascinating. We studied Florida and took a trip to Pensacola. We learned that 30 years ago, we learned from vendors that were 30 years behind in capturing um, stormwater, litter in the stormwater. We learned from Florida that they went to the legislature and they passed a law saying, declaring stormwater to be a utility that could be put on a f uh, utility bill. And so when they did that, they basically created a funding source for any community that wanted to be able to fund a program to pick up litter in a stormwater. But then there was an amazing unintended um, thing that happened that, that was, it was completely unexpected. When they had the program and the money and the millions to clean up litter, they found that they weren't flooding because that same money was used for educating that we don't have right now. It was used for keeping the canals clean that we don't have right now. It was used for new canals, money for new canals that we don't have right now, intercepting litter. This is amazing. And if you think about this, litter the litter of our grandfathers was not toxic ours is we should be calling this something that goes on a utility bill and florida saw that 30 years ago and it was because of the clean water act they took that act and they actually strengthened florida laws 
and in strength, and then they provided the funding vehicle to the towns and 160 towns in Florida. And, and so we say, well, don't do it on the back end. Absolutely, we should do it on the back end because the streets are the lipstick and the pearls and the wetland and the watershed is the soul. And the soul is where we have fun and we go fishing and we go hiking and we wrestle with alligators and we do all kind of crazy things <laughs> and have our culture. Of course we should clean it up on the back end. And when we clean it up on the back end, it just all goes out. And all of a sudden these people are there having all these, this fun, start protecting it. And that's what Florida did. And that's what Vermillion did. And that's what we have got to do. But Vermillion could lose their funding because it's on a whatever you call it, the tax thing. We cannot let us lose the funding to clean this up. It's got to be on a utility bill. Well, that's encouraging to hear that there are solutions and examples of success stories out there. Stefik, let me ask you, what do you think when you hear Marie's story? And I guess to follow up on that, how do you get youth involved, people your inv age involved in something like this when there are so many other things uh, students in high school have on their plate right now? Yeah, so the youth, we are the future environmental leaders. So um, our actions today will have a large consequence uh, in the future. And so the best thing that the youth can do is to get involved and to advocate, you know, um, let people know that this is an issue that you care about and that this is an issue that is affecting your community. Talk with your parents, your teachers, your school administrators, even your peers, and um, get your peers involved, engage them uh, in this, this topic. You know, you can organize uh, litter cleanups in your community. You can host an event to raise environmental awareness. And you can also lead by example by showing other people um, ways that, that they can reduce their own waste and thus reduce uh, litter and pollution. Um, one of the biggest, easiest ways that, uh, that the youth can do this is by choosing to reuse, uh, rethinking your, your choices, using less uh, single-use items, you know, bringing your own reusable water bottle to school, bringing uh, your lunch and your snacks in reusable containers with reusable cutlery and just talking with your friends about this, uh, letting them know that it exists because uh, you know the change isn't gonna happen overnight, but it has to start somewhere. And we uh, have uh, the ability to start making this change now so that hopefully we can have a better situation in the future. Well, I must say, I think a lot of the young people I've been around certainly have a greater awareness of some of those things, single use items and those types of things than a lot of people in my generation. So that's great that, that, that you're promoting that. Um, Alma, let me turn to you again. Um, I understand that China did something back in 2018 that actually made it cheaper for Americans to dispose of plastics in the landfills rather than recycle it, which is what we want. Um, what was going on there? Well, China banned foreign um, solid waste. So we could no longer send our recyclables over to China and 60% of our recyclables were going over there. So when they banned it, we, uh, were, uh, we were stuck with it. We had to figure out what we were going to do with it. The reason China banned it and the problem with it was that it was contaminated. So it did, it was not fully just one and two plastics or it wasn't all cardboard. It had stuff mixed into it that contaminated. We're kind of wishful recyclers. So we like to throw everything in. And there was a time in the United States, there was a time in Louisiana that curbside recycling was separated. So you would put your plastics in one, you'd put your glass, you'd put your paper, your cardboard, your aluminum cans and the, the hauler would take it uh, separated to the recycling facilities and so you had pretty clean stock going to the recycling material cycling factories and so they like that it's easy for them to take a whole thing of milk jugs and make it into a, a new milk jug but if there's something in there that's not a milk jug say a tide container or a clamshell that will disturb the process of the factory and it will lower the value of the recyclable um, that they're producing. Also, the cost of recycling um, has shot up. I mean, because we are trying to sort everything, there's a substant substantial cost to try to sort it all out. People put whatever they want in there. And aluminum cans values have gone down. It's 
39 cents a pound, I think, and it takes about 32, 33 cans to make a pound. So you're looking at about one cent per can. So it's just not as reasonable for people to recycle as it used to be. They're not making on the back end. And of course, nothing is recycled until it is made into a new product. And so we are encouraging people to buy recyclable products. We are trying to get industries into Louisiana that use recyclable products um, and use recycled use recycling base to make new products. And so they will buy stuff from our MRF, from our recycling facility, and then make it into new products. So the Louisiana Recycling Coalition is trying to connect those dots between the haulers, the manufacturers, the end users, and then trying to get people in Louisiana to really buy recycled products and get the market up. You kind of alluded to the uh, the notion of wish cycling or wish recycling. You know, I think as a consumer, many of us just want to know what is it we can do to actually recycle better. Could you help us so that we're not wish cycling or re -wish, wish recycling and, and actually doing something that would be helpful in recycling? Yes, definitely. Uh, when in doubt, throw it out. If it's not something that you know for sure is going to be recycling, if you recycled, if you have any question, just throw it into the garbage can. It would be better to go to the landfill than it would be to go to the recycling facility and get caught up in the machines. Uh, plastic bags get caught up in the machines all the time. Uh, people recycle hoses. You know, I have these glasses right here. They're made of plastic. So, oh yeah, plastic's recyclable. I can throw it in there. But at our recycling facility, it is not recyclable. And also with cell phones or um, electronics, they are recyclable, but not in the curbside recycling bin or in drop-off uh, recycling bins. You have to take those to specific places to be recycled. So it's all about education, and I encourage everyone to keep checking back with their uh, parishes, with their municipalities, and find out exactly what is recyclable and what is not, and, uh, and make sure that you just put in the clean stuff. And if you're not sure, it's better to go into the garbage can. Well, thanks so much for that. And this has certainly been an insightful hour on this topic of litter. We have run out of time for our discussion tonight, but we do want to thank uh, Marie Constantine, uh, Mr. Rainey, Ms. Robichaux, and all of our participants for their input. We encourage you to comment on tonight's show by visiting lpb.org slash public square and clicking on the join the conversation link. And we'd love to hear from you and get your comments. Again, thanks for watching and have a great evening. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org.